So uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and Todd. Sure. Todd is out of uh, North Dakota and is the systems engineer for you guys, right? Senior applications engineer. Senior applications engineer. I have to get that right. Yeah. Yep. So let me turn it over to Jake. Yeah. Jake Koval, uh, also with EAC, Product Development Solutions. I'm a sales executive. I live here in, in Dallas. Um, and then we've got Todd Liebenau, who will be doing the, the demonstration for us. He's in Fargo, North Dakota, senior applications engineer, and he's our technical expert for for IoT. So again, we're going to be exploring Industry 4.0 and the digital thread. And um, uh, Todd, if you could go to the next slide, <clears throat> we'll go to the agenda, brief agenda. Um, introductions, we pretty much knocked those out, but I'll run through those again really quickly. Dan McMillan, Regional Director of Sales, he also lives here in, in Plano. Um, just talked about myself and Todd, so uh, we could keep going. Um, I will be talking a little bit more about who EAC is, uh, just pretty much a brief overview and background of us. Uh, and then I'll be handing it over to Todd, who again, will get into all the technical nitty gritty. He'll be running through uh, the digital thread. He'll be doing a demo. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions, uh, Q&A at the end. I guess it's important to, to state, we'll have to wait to do that because of this whole muting situation. So if you could hold questions to the end, um, that would be great. Uh, Todd, if you could go to the next slide, please. Who is EAC? Next slide again, Todd. Uh, before I get going, just wanted to ask the room, is anyone, have you guys ever heard of us? Have you ever worked with us? Any familiarity at all? Okay, good. You guys will be learning something new. So um, as Dan touched on, EAC, we were founded in 1996 with roots in engineering and analysis. Uh, we were founded and based in our based in Minneapolis. Uh, however, <clears throat> since we've become a fully remote organization, so we're about 100 employees and we're scattered throughout the country. Uh, the idea with that being uh, if and when we're needed to be on site anywhere in the country, we're, we're within one to two days max um, time frame from, from being able to do so. Uh, our mission is to transform the way companies design, manufacture, connect to, and service their products. Basically, what that means, in other words, is everything we do to help companies build better products is connected through your organization and ours. Uh, we like to view ourselves not only as a value-added re reseller, but highly trusted business consultants. All of our software offerings have services and service teams wrapped around them. So um, we're more than just a value added reseller. Uh, I guess my next question to the group is, are any of you or who all is familiar with PTC? Anyone? Okay, we've got a few. Okay, well, so as Dan mentioned, and, and I just previously mentioned, we're a value added reseller for PTC. Uh, they're over a billion dollar software company. and uh, we actually offer their entire product line, uh, which is unique because the majority of our competitors, uh, they, they can't do that. They, they don't offer the entire product line. This product line includes CAD, PLM, SLM, augmented reality, and of course, IoT. We've been a leading global service provider for them for over 25 years which is the longest running um, out of all of the competitors, all of, all of our competitors and all of the service providers they have uh, and all. A uh, couple awards we like to talk about that we're pretty proud of from 2021. Uh, we were their solution partner of the year, and we were also their most impactful in digital transformation at scale. Basically, what this does, this sums up our, our, you know, our capabilities. And, and to date, we've run over 5,300 engagements. 2,100 of those have been in training. Um, well, at least 2,100. 1,800 plus have been in engineering. We've done at least 1,100 PLM and 280 plus in SLM. Uh, next slide, please, Todd. Uh, and just to break that down a little further, uh, some of our specialties include product and service information um, or information services, which is broken down even further into tech pub implementation, XML, data content management, style sheet, doc, style sheet development, and S1000D work instructions. Uh, if you could click the next one for me, Todd. Next, this is why we're all here, smart connected products and operations. IoT services, uh, breaking that down a little bit further, telemetry, monitor, control, 
application and dashboard development and trend analysis and predictive analysis. And last but not least, augmented reality services. Uh, we do work instructions, training, service procedures, and product demonstrations. So that is the long and the short of EAC and our capabilities. So I will go ahead and pass it on over to, to Todd now to get a little more technical for you guys. And I will go ahead and mute here, Todd. So. so we like to talk in terms of a digital thread, but what exactly is that? Right. So in the product development uh, space where we uh, help our customers and, and companies uh, utilize PTC's products and help them solve products along the line of product, product development, we like to think in terms of this thing called the digital thread. So we start off with the initial product development, the design, but then we also think in terms of manufacturing uh, that design, taking it uh, out to the shop floor and producing it. But then we also think of the customers too, right? And, and there's service activities that are involved in that process. And so we, this digital thread really brings all of this uh, together and the goal here is to make sure that the people that are working uh, throughout this entire process get the right information at the right place at the right time. And, you know, this digital thread is really the concept that ties all of that together. And so how do we do that? So we'll start really with the end in mind here. So this would be a, an EAC application that we've developed on, uh, on PTC's uh, platform to uh, reach into the, their database, right, the, the product development company's uh, database, and then uh, get that information where it needs to be uh, at, the, you know, uh, at the right place at the right time. So said so that, uh, and really what this is is sort of a top level quick access window into the database that's, that's bringing uh, data from several different sources together. So somebody out on the shop floor, uh, somebody out uh, in the service location uh, gets that information that they need. Uh, so what are we looking at here? So in this case, we, we just want to find some information out about a particular assembly. And in this application, I'm showing the full bill of material for that. I've got an indented structure. Uh, I can do a search on that information. But note, um, in the lower portion of the window here, uh, I've got uh, additional change items that are associated with that. So things like a problem report or a variance or change request, something like that, that I might need to say, hey, I've got a problem assembling this. What do I do with that? Well, I can actually log those change items against that, and we can do this all from this one page. So that's pretty cool because we, we've actually built this application around this specific function to let people get at the information that they need uh, and then perform their, their work action on it that they need to do. And this can actually integrate multiple different systems together. So we think in terms of ERP and MRP and those types of things. Uh, we want to bring all that information together and really integrate that. Uh, and, and bring this together uh, in a single point of access. And so what we're looking at here would be assembly instructions for somebody out on the shop floor where we're looking at a specific work order that's been uh, created in an ERP system. And then I've got the ability to provide work instructions to that uh, uh, you know, shop floor personnel uh, along with uh, you know, detailed instructions but that I can also connect that together with uh, you know, smart connected tools. So if I've got a torque wrench uh, that, that I need to say, I need to torque these three bolts to 27 Newton meters and I need to timestamp that, that says, uh, you know, Todd Liebenau actually did that, per, you know, actually torque that to that spec, you know, specification on today's date, right? So we can track that information. So it really is bringing all of that uh, together along with the work instructions from the, the manufacturing execution system. So, and, and we can author that information. Again, it's all tied back to the original CAD data. So the, if there's any changes to that, so we change that from three bolts to four bolts, then my work instructions are gonna update both the images along with the other documentation that goes along with that. And so how do we do that, right? So traditionally, that type of thing is done in a very manual paper-based uh, method. Uh, there might be, uh, you know, uh, PDFs or, or drawings and things like that that get printed out. Maybe there's instruction manuals that are created, uh, text-based, uh, three-ring binders, racks of binders out in the shop, things like that that, you know, show people how to put things together. With the advent of augmented reality, I can really bring all of that together uh, using the digital thread. So uh, using a, a tablet uh, or a phone or, or head-mounted device, I can actually consume those instructions and overlay that on top of the object that I'm looking at. You know, it's right there in front of me. I want to see how it's performing or I want to see how to put it together, take it apart, perform my maintenance on it, those types of things. And, and that's all tied together with this concept of, of a digital thread.
So I'm just going to build out this slide here. Uh, really what this is, this is sort of a 40,000-foot um, uh, overview of what that di digital thread can look like. So what are we looking at? On the, if we start the, the design process on the left-hand side, it might start off with things like requirements. You know, say, say we're designing um, some sort of vehicle and it's going to have some you know, certain criteria. It needs to operate in, a, in an environment that I need to you know, basically define how that's going to work and, and what its task is and the different functions and features it needs to have. The center core, the, the thread here of that would be the, the CAD design. So that's your you know, original CAD modeling, parts assemblies, drawings, that kind of stuff. But then as you can see, there's other pieces of information that go along with that. There's bills of material, there's change items on there. Maybe I've got a problem report or change request. So typical design uh, processes that go along with that, all the way through quality and compliance and, and different families of that. Uh, maybe I've got you know different variations of a, of, a, of, a, of a water ski or something like that. I've got a you know a two up uh, uh, watercraft, maybe a single one uh, or a single rider. Uh, I've got different variations of that, so I need to manage that as a family or platform of that. So that actually branches off, and we need to consider things like manufacturing and service. And those would be the other two parallel threads there in the top and the bottom. We've got a manufacturing thread, and they've got their own set of requirements and information that goes along with that. And the same for service, right? So we've got things like uh, service bills of material information, uh, remote monitoring. Maybe I want to find out how that, um, how that uh, uh, jet ski is actually performing and get some real-time feedback of that while it's actually out in the field. And so that's sort of the concept of the digital thread, the things that get tied together. That's the what. And we start on the left, we, we, we start off with requirements, and we end up on the right-hand side with a physical product. But then how does that all get tied together, right? Well, so that's using, again, we're talking about PTC's family of tools, suite of tools including uh, Windchill as a data management tool, Creo Parametric for design, uh, ThingWorks for connecting all of these things together, sharing information, um, integrating different systems together, and Vuforia for the augmented reality aspect of, of the uh, information sharing that. And it's all tied together with this closed loop quality uh, and data uh, driven design, you know, things like uh, the Kappas and nonconformance and, and change requests and those things. It's a closed loop system so that I can look back over my shoulder at any time and say, well, gosh, how many problem reports do we have? Uh, how long were they open? Uh, and, and who actually decided which changes were made and when and when did we actually um, you know, implement those things? So all of that, uh, that rich information that really defines the product uh, can actually be managed and, and maintained and, and acted on uh, through the use of this uh, closed loop system. So if we think about it from an organizational standpoint, what kind of information are we really talking about? So in, in from, in, we spend a lot of time helping uh, customers that are in the product development space. So with the, the core of what we do is really this, this 3D uh, design, and we need to share that information out across the organization. And we want to make sure that people in all of the dis different disparate groups in the, in the organization are really sharing that same information Again, thinking in terms of the digital thread, you know, people in design engineering and service and quality, they all need to be looking at the same current version of, of the objects, uh, the parts, drawings, assemblies, and all those kinds of things. So we're all building uh, and thinking about the, the right version of that model. So we're building quality product the first time, uh, you know, minimizing time to, to, to market and, and scrap and all those kinds of things. So we're really trying to make sure that we're really all singing from the same page of the hymnal, if you think about it that way. So if we you know drill into that a little bit further, what does that look like? So you know we talk about going uh, from the CAD in the design group to the factory. What does that look like? There there could be things like uh, critical characteristics, you know, like uh, you know tolerances, uh, G and T, surface finish, those kinds of things that that are all in, inherent in the CAD model. But how do we actually share that across uh, the organization? Well, there's sort of a flow chart that works from left to right on this slide that starts off with a CAD model, and then we make sure that that's shareable and viewable and usable by other people uh, either upstream in purchasing or downstream in manufacturing and service so they can access that information. Again, they're looking at the right information at the right time through, uh, through markups, red lines, you know, annotations, process plans, inspection, uh, and driving that all the way out to the shop floor. Here's what it might look like if we, uh, you know, look at a full entire product life cycle. So again, we mentioned jet skis or snowmobiles, things like that, uh, as as just a, an example we can kind of hang our hat on. So we have some sort of basis for discussion. We might have different uh, uh, variations of that. So we might have different uh, size snowmobiles, different engine configurations, uh, different options and whatnot. So we would have different bills of material starting off from the engineering design, but then that can propagate out into different variations of that. Uh, and then we have a different bill of material, say for example, for manufacturing. 
oftentimes what happens is that the, um, the manufacturing group is going to add items into that bill of material for items that are never, ever going to get designed. Uh, you know, you're not going to design oil or you're not going to have a part for oil in your snowmobile or, or an engine, right? But manufacturing still needs to account for that. So there's different bills of material throughout the life cycle of the object. And, and Windchill helps you manage that. So you can have different bills of material for different views of the world, whether you're in uh, design, manufacturing, or service, for example. And that's really what we're talking about here is, is, is utilizing that information and making sure that it's up to date and every, you know, it's, it's complete and accurate information. In the lower half of the slide, we talk about how do we actually consume or utilize that information. So we'll show you some augmented reality things uh, here in a little bit. Uh, it all starts off with the CAD models, and then it spins off into uh, different areas of use, whether that might be for uh, you know, optimization, simulations, uh, service instructions, manufacturing instructions. And there's different ways to, to build out that information, including things like uh, IoT connectivity and augmented reality for uh, service and instructions and, and those types of things. So this is just an example of what this might look like in the manufacturing floor. I'll just build out the slide here. There's several different things. We'll just kind of talk through that. So what we're presenting here is one pane of glass that has uh, information that's appropriate for the use, uh, you know, where this is actually being consumed. So if this is uh, out on the shop floor and I'm looking at a specific uh, work order instruction, so the operator is going to get just the information that they need to put this assembly together, but it's pulling in information from different locations. So it might be pulling in information from the, the, the CAD uh, and, and work instructions, process plans, inspections, reports, and those types of things. But it's also pulling in information for manufacturing execution, right? Well, uh, how, how, how long is this supposed to take me? What's the order of operations? What's the instructions? And, and give me step-by-step -step instructions with information and images that tell me, uh, you know, how do I put this thing together? Uh, and then while I'm doing that, the system can keep track of, of the, you know, the timestamps. So how long is it actually taking me to put this together? Uh, am I performing at, at the expected rate or am I having an issue? Is there a bottleneck in the process? Uh, and then also I can connect up to industrial tools, right? So I mentioned before things like smart tools where I'm actually capturing um, the, the different information, whether that's torque specs or other utilization and timestamping as to when I actually did that. So I can get that signed off on. Uh, so that uh, step is completed per spec uh, at a certain time and date. So what does this really mean? So uh, here's some examples of the types of, uh, you know, uh, performance increases or benefits that we see from doing this type of thing. I won't read you the slide, but you get a feel for the type of things you can uh, expect to see here using the digital thread built on PTC's platform. Uh, the technology stack here, um, uh, as far as uh, manufacturing efficiencies, uh, time to market, uh, those types of things. So again, that's pretty pretty significant. Um, you know, in in design and manufacturing, you know, uh, there's all sometimes a sense of, hey, I'm just doing my design and I throw it over to the wall to manufacturing, really without a thought for what happens after that. And this really uh, does a does a great job of bringing everybody together on the team and making it a cohesive team, sharing that information and making it easier to to do the jobs uh, and, and produce a quality product. And some specific metrics uh, in terms of uh, acceleration, the time to market, uh, reducing cost of quality, uh, maximizing revenue. And these are some specific use cases that we've seen um, from, from utilizing this concept of the digital thread. We got a specific use case here. We work with the customer, uh, namely uh, JR Automation. Won't read you the slide, but we spent some time working with them. They were originally uh, a customer of ours, uh, just focusing on the, the you know the design aspect of things, just the, the uh, parts assemblies and, and those kinds of things. But we helped them um, Im improve their their design process and manufacturing process through the use of the productivity apps. That's what I should. Uh, uh, we talked about there. We had one slide with that one pane of glass with uh, bringing together all the information, and we 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 looked at the. Uh, their situation, we helped them uh, with a productivity app that uh, streamlined their redlining process. And so far, the benefit that they've recognized from using this is, is uh, 1.4 million uh, because we've streamlined the, their process and made it easier for them to actually communicate uh, red lines and issues from the shop floor back to design and make those changes and, and actually close that loop and decrease the time it takes uh, to complete those red lines. So again, pretty significant impact uh, through uh, this concept of the digital thread. 
This slide talks about how do we do that, right? So that's kind of the, some of the what we do, right? So not so much on picks and clicks and specific, you know, technology, uh, but we use this, uh, these concept of assessments. And we've got several different types of these assessments. This is really at the core of what EAC does and, and who we are. You know, we often say we're a learn first organization. This is how we do the learning. Right, we, we want to really truly understand what it is that you do, uh, and and get to know you and and help uh, help you solve your business problems. And the way that we do that is through the use of these assessments, where uh, we would come in and, and look at a uh, your your overall process using a product development system assessment, and really look at uh, the process from from quote to delivery um, across the organization. So we don't just focus on on like the the design and manufacturing group. That would be a functional group assessment, but really looking at the broad spectrum of of the business and understand what are the challenges that you have, what are the, the bottlenecks that you have, and what are the goals, and then sort of map back into a, a solution set which could include uh, people, process, or perhaps technology to help you address those concerns and really uh, drive towards, uh, you know, solving those problems and thinking in terms of, you know, what's what's the positive outcome of, of doing uh, these things and, and making some changes to the way that you actually do your product development. So it's through the use of these assessments that we really uh, want to understand how you do uh, business and, and the problems that you're having and then uh, map back solutions into, into helping you get there. So that's kind of an overview of, of uh, some of the, the what we do at EAC. The specific thing that I've got next is what are we going to see today? So we've got several different things uh, keyed up, uh, ready to go for you. We talk in terms of EAC Smart Factory, uh, or the idea sorter, as I like to call it. Uh, and what I've got here on the screen is a, a screenshot of a mashup or dashboard that we put together. And so really, this the idea here between uh, or behind this, uh, what you see on, on the right-hand side of the screen there is sort of a little, uh, a little factory. And the idea is that we want to, uh, there's a lot of big ideas kind of rolling around in, in our, our heads, and we want to try and filter them out. We want to find the big ideas and, and sort of capture them and investigate them and then, you know, kind of... Uh, perform some, some actions on that, right? We want to capture the big ideas and do stuff with them. And so this is actually a sort of a physical manifestation of that thought process with the idea of mapping that back into the digital thread. So it's great to talk about the digital thread, but what, what, is that, what can that actually look like in, in reality? So we came up with this uh, little uh, collection of parts and assembly and we designed it, uh, uh, we built it, we 3D printed uh, the parts that you see there and that's one of the other things that we do is, is we work with uh, Form Labs as a partner and we resell the, uh, the 3D printers. And so we came up with this idea that we're going to take this thing on the road and we're going to show it and we're going to really talk to people about what the digital thread means and what it looks like. And this is, this is what we came up with. So we're going to use this to take a look at um, uh, you know, real-time feedback, uh, you know, connecting to this device. It's actually in Minneapolis, as was mentioned. I'm in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, and you guys are all down there in Texas and, and watching on the, on the webcast. So I'm going to interact with this, uh, this idea sorter uh, and, and get some performance information on that and, and kind of share some information about that. Uh, and we'll also do some augmented reality around that, too, to show you digital twins and some other things we can, we can do with that. And that would be this slide, right? So the augmented reality. Uh, so different ways we can consume that information. I've got uh, my phone keyed up and ready to show you the, the digital tw twin. We can also do uh, that type of thing with uh, head-mounted devices like a, uh, like a HoloLens or a, a RealWare uh, to actually consume that information for training and instruction. And the productivity apps. So this would be uh, sort of uh, a screenshot that, that kind of talks about that. This is where I'm actually reaching into the database and then getting that information out to the people that need to, uh, to do that uh, with very focused applications. Like I just want to do a quick search. I want to find out some information about a particular part or an assembly, or maybe I want to find a you know, bill of material information for that. And so this is a, some, some a tailored apps that we put together to, to let people quickly and easily access that information uh, and then uh, you know, do what they need to based on that. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm actually in Fargo, and this is our idea sorter that's currently running in Minneapolis. I've got a, a Nest webcam kind of pointed at that thing here so we can actually see it running. And this would be the, uh, the dashboard uh, that's actually giving me information about what's actually happening with that. So if I go ahead and, and stop that for right now, we'll go ahead and stop that. And uh, my camera will update here, and we should see the uh, auger stomp. So again, remote uh, uh, collaboration or, or uh, interaction with that device. And you can see there, you know, there's a, a, um, another copy of that dashboard up and running in the background. 
but uh, we built this dashboard to kind of show uh, you know interaction with this and and just like you would expect to see uh, operational efficiencies and those types of things uh, you know with connected devices out on the shop floor for example um, you, you can do that and create that sort of dashboard here uh, to provide that information one thing I want to mention so this uh, presentation might have sort of a um, you know, manufacturing sort of feel to it I wouldn't think in terms of just manufacturing or, or you know processes um, this can also be applied to uh, products as well. So if we think about this idea sorter as an end product that I'm interacting with, it doesn't have to be just uh, in terms of manufacturing. So I'm actually interacting with this as a smart connected um, device that's out, uh, you know, out on, in the field and connected to uh, devices on the edge and, and interacting with it that way. So I don't want to give you the impression that it's, this is just uh, in, in terms of, of manufacturing. So it could be either process or, or uh, manufacturing or along with smart connected products as well. So anyway, this is the, the dashboard that goes along with this. So I've got controls. If I wanted to actually interact with the, the database and say, hey, you know what, I've got a problem report, I can certainly do that. Uh, again, here, if I wanted to actually inspect a big idea, if I was in the room or somebody was standing there uh, next to the machine, uh, we could go ahead and hit the big, uh, inspect the big idea. What that would do, we would pick, a, a, pick a, an idea from the device here and actually drop it in my hand. So I could actually you know, do some physical inspection of that. I won't do that now because what that'll do is actually take that marble, pick it up and then drop it on the floor, which is not a good idea. But again, you get the idea that I can interact with that uh, the device right from here. We'll go ahead and fire it up again. And you can see that it's actually tracking information here over time. And we just started the device. And uh, so again, remote control uh, of that particular object. So that's a little bit on that. Now, the next thing I might show is, uh, let me fire up my phone, and let me get logged into that. And so what I've got here is on another screen. We'll drag this guy over here. Oops, say well. Here it is. So I've got a digital twin of this, and I'll just bring this up here. Right? I didn't want to necessarily maximize that, but that'll work. So I'm going to go ahead and just reset this because my phone went to sleep. And I'm just going to go ahead and scan this thing mark, right? And I've got this, and now it's actually just waiting for me to pick a flat place to land that. So this would be the augmented reality portion of this. And so this is actually uh, interacting with that. So let me make this fit so I can fit everything on the screen. So the digital twin here, let me go ahead and stop this and restart this. I think I probably just need to reload this. But this would be, so you see I'm actually looking at this on my phone on top of my desktop so I can actually spin this thing around, zoom in and zoom out. And when I start and stop the uh, digital twin here, it should restart. Hey, Todd, we're not. Yep. We're not yep. Yep. I see we're that not now. Face. I see that now. <laughs> yep. 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 There we go. Yep. Thanks, Jake. So, yeah, it's something that I, I clicked in the window and it went behind there. Too many windows. So, I don't know. If, if I hold that steady, and zoom in on that a little bit. Right, so now you, you can actually see when I start and stop that device, right, so it's actually a digital twin using the augmented reality of that. Let me click that back here. Sorry, too many windows. But so the augmented reality aspect of that. So I don't even have to be in the room with this device to actually see how it's working. And I can get my operational efficiencies there. I've got an OEE. I've got a performance value. I've got quality, right? So now it's stopped right now, which is why it's actually blinking at me saying, hey, that device is not currently running. So I might need to actually investigate that. So maybe on the back side of that, there's a little stop start button. I may need to actually interact with that. So again, starting with the CAD model and bringing that out through the concept of the digital thread tying that together, I've got a digital twin of this object here that I can interact with on my desktop, even though I'm you know, 250 miles away from it. And so this is done in a phone, right? But I can, excuse me, I can build an experience for that that actually is also consumed on a head-mounted device like a HoloLens or a tablet. So again, a little bit of the augmented reality experience. The other thing that I would show you here would be, what does that look like um, from the development standpoint? So here is, let me maximize this. I got a bunch of stuff going on, on the screen. So here is that um, 
same idea sorter. But what I've done in this experience is I'm actually focusing on uh, maybe some assembly instructions, right? So for example, I want to show somebody how to put this together. There's some components that are missing. And this is set up for HoloLens, right? So I built this little interface over here with a couple of buttons on it that says, you know, play, rewind, reset, etc. And when I preview that, I can go ahead and click on this tab here, and it should preview that. We actually are in the preview mode right now. If I go ahead and hit the play button, right, it's going to actually show me how those components go together, right? So I can interact with this um, and actually, you know, you know, push some buttons and show somebody what the process looks like to actually assemble this. If I want to, you know, back up a step or replay a step. So it's really about um, providing that uh, information that, that you want in the experience, right? So what do I need to show somebody? What do I need to highlight for them? Or what do, I, what do they need to see to actually do that, uh, that particular function? So really, the, the augmented reality piece is, is about experiences and sharing information and then you know, building that out. What do I need to, to show somebody to do? Are they servicing something? Or are they interacting with something? Uh, do they need to see pressures and temperatures? And, and so that IoT data that's coming in from sensors can can be augmented um, in the, the you know, in with the experience, so I can actually see what's happening there as far as performance indicators or flows or temperatures or pressures or those types of things. So that's really where uh, one of the big uh, aspects of bringing together the IoT data along with the augmented reality experience is marrying those things together to, to really give somebody a, a, a rich understanding of what actually is happening to that item or that object that they're standing right in front of in the field. And so if you wanted to go and uh, download the, the Vuforia View applications, right? So you go ahead and hit this little thing mark on your phone or tablet. Uh, I can share this out with you if you wanted to actually see what the smart demonstrator looks like, right? So you go ahead and just scan this with your phone and you'd see what this looks like uh, on your phone or tablet. Uh, and then you could uh, you know, take a look at that digital twin or um, uh, this uh, idea sorter assembly process and kind of see, play around with that and kind of see what that looks like. So that's sort of the concept of the digital thread. If we bring that back um, to the other piece I might have shown you here was the, uh, let me pull up in this other browser window here, right? So what is this data management and interaction with, our, with the uh, productivity apps? What does that look like? So this is uh, kind of reaching back into the database and, and, and the, the backbone of the digital thread, if you will. Uh, and this is how the, how we built out these applications to show these different types of things, right? So there's applications, they're very tailored, very specific, uh, and doing, you know, one thing, like just looking at bill of material reports or tasks that are assigned to me or change management items. And so we got task specific items here. I'm just doing a quick search in this case for items that are associated with this top level uh, idea sorter. Right, so I go in and I just type in the information that I'm looking for here. And these uh, tell me right now, we've integrated this with other systems that say, hey, here's the cost of this coming from our ERP system. And I've got 336 of them uh, in stock on hand and ready to go. Another way that I could look at the information would be to say, hey, what's, what's uh, the information? What's all tied to this? What's all in this assembly? Right, so here's the indented uh, bill of material or structure for that assembly. And so I can kind of scroll up and down in here and see what's there. I can click on components and it'll give me a little thumbnail view of what that item is. And I can see the different components that are associated with that. Along with that, uh, I'm, right now I'm looking at markups, but there might be other related documents, right? So there might be a presentation that's associated with that, or there might be other items like change objects, problem reports, change requests. Or if I needed to, I could create a new one of those objects here. This is kind of a cool application because it you know, lets me access that information, but then perform other actions on it. So if I've got a problem that I need to let somebody know, hey, there's a problem with this thing, um, uh, this is where I would start that process. And so when we actually travel with this thing in, in the field, we have a big shipping container and uh, you know, we unpack it, we set it up. And when we're done, we tear it down and put it back in the box. Well, as you'd expect, uh, you know, this thing gets shipped in, in the bottom of an airplane, bounces around, and every once in a while, we'll, we'll you know, find that we've got a problem. We've got a broken part uh, or something gets damaged in the process of setting up or tearing down. So we've, you know, can, we can log a problem report against that. And we take it through that whole digital thread process where we got a problem report on a part that actually broke, and maybe we need to do some stress analysis on that. We need to you know, 3D print another copy of that part, something like that. We actually use this system to to keep track of all of those things and, and do product development improvements, and, you know, it really is, is a way for us to, to track and manage, uh, you know, really what happens with this device as it, as it travels around the country. 
Here's a bill of material report, just kind of showing you a quick walkthrough of what these different applications do. So in this case, I'm looking at the cost rollup, uh, for example, and you know, what's the current state of all of the items in here. So if I'm doing product development from a manager standpoint, maybe I want to see, well, what's the current status? Where, where, where are things at? It looks like everything is released here in, in this case, so that's all good. But if I had other items that were in different life cycle states, like uh, work in progress or obsolete, they would show up here in those different life cycle states, right? So I can quickly see what the current status of all of the items in my, in my uh, assembly are. This page talks about the items that are actually kind of tied together and, and what's all, you know, how, what's the association between these items. So in this top level sorter, right, I've got uh, different items. So here's a uh, PowerPoint presentation that's assigned or associated with that. I've got a CAD assembly that's associated with that. So again, just a nice way for me to see how things are actually tied together um, you know, in, inside the system. Because there's lots of stuff that goes into product development, right? It's not just CAD parts and drawings. There's there's specification documents, there's you know PowerPoints, there's MathCAD spreadsheet or spreadsheets and lots of different information that goes together. And this is a the application that lets you see how those things are all really tied together. And we think in terms of managing the process, right? So there's tasks that are going to be assigned to different people or, or uh, you know, throughout the entire process. So here's the tasks that the, I would have uh, as a particular user. These are things that are assigned to me. And I can see the, the current status. So I've got quite a few things that I need to look at um, relative to this particular product. Um, or they might might be several different products. So these are the things that I should be working on um, and, and you know, closing out um, the different change items as I complete my tasks. And here, this again, another page that talks about change management that shows the current status of items in the system. So this last one was tasks that are assigned to me. This tab that we're looking at here is really different um, change items in the system. So there's a difference between uh, a, a problem report, which is like a digital suggestion box, and a change request that says, hey, maybe we're going to review this and actually decide whether or not we're going to make the change or not. And then when we do decide we want to make a change, we would have a change notification. That's when we assign tasks to people and, and kind of flow that process forward from there. So this is a window into that change management process to, to show me what the current status of things are relative to this particular product. And so that's, those are the things that we, you know, think of in terms of a digital thread and how does that really all tie together? I know that, you know, a lot of your focus today is really on IoT and maybe a little bit of AR, uh, but this concept of the digital thread really ties all of this together instead of thinking at, about it as, you know, disparate uh, systems or, or point solutions. And uh, I don't want to minimize AR, or IoT, or, or data management, but when you bring all of those pieces together, uh, it, it really leverages the power of, of all of the pieces individually. I think the sum is, is bigger than the, uh, than the uh, addition of just the individual parts, if that makes sense. So those are the things that I had to show this morning. Again, Jake, I'll pause and see if there's any questions or comments in the room. I think we uh, I'm trying to manage the time and make sure that we got through everything uh, without running over. So we started in 96, uh, based in Minneapolis, Todd. We had a question just about our company. Mm -hmm. um, based mm -hmm. in and founded in Minneapolis, we're now fully remote. We're about 100 employees. Uh, we're scattered throughout the country, so people are all over the place. Uh, basically allows us to be on site within a day or two if and when it's needed. Extremely fascinating. My question. How do you present the ROI to a manufacturer who's sort of traditional? And, you know, it's kind of obvious they need to do this, but on the other hand, somebody's going to say, how much is it? Does that make sense? So you've got to have, what's the, so when you walk in with value proposition, that's what that looks like. So, Todd, we got a question about uh, presenting ROI to a, a potential organization or client regarding all of this. He said it's, it's extremely fascinating. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you have any answer on that? Well, sure. It, um, well, th there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, I guess you muted me, right? So I don't have to worry about the feedback. Thanks for that. Uh, so it's a lot of different ways to approach that, really. And that kind of goes back to understanding why we're doing that, right? So how do we, we get to the point where we, you know, we would start off with an initial presentation like this, but then we, you know, pause and step back and say, okay, this is great. 
right? We, but we've got all this stuff and we can't eat the elephant all in one, you know, one sitting, right? So we have to go back and figure out, well, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest pain point? Where do we start with this process? And that's, that's the cool thing. We really can start anywhere along in this process. It doesn't have to start with CAD because the windshield tool can actually manage really any CAD. It doesn't really matter or any type of data for that matter. So if, if data management is is the first place we will want to start, well, we can do that. Or if you had maybe, if you wanted to focus on some IoT connectivity and, and that type of thing, we can start there. Or if you wanted to start with, uh, you know, assembly instructions and service instructions, we can start there. So that really gives you an idea that we can start anywhere in this process. But back to your question, how do we how do we present this from an ROI standpoint? We really have to understand, you know, what are the what are the what's your process today, and how do you how are you doing things, and what kind of time does that take, and then you know, it's incumbent upon us to show that this, you know, uh, there's a benefit here uh, and, you know, drill into to the details of what it takes today versus what it could look like in the future and, you know, build out the the, the deltas from that, right? So it, it really goes back to understanding uh, the current state and, and then kind of look at the future state and what are the benefits from what the benefits it looks like. Hey, Todd, right as you were getting to the meat and potatoes of what you're saying on ROI, we lost connection. So can you can you pick up where you left off there? Sorry about that. So, so yeah, it really goes back to to uh, you know the understanding uh, what it is that you're trying to do. So like I, I'm not sure where I actually cut out. So that's the problem. So um, the the good thing is we can really start anywhere along the the path on this, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to start with CAD or any specific other instance or location along the process. But it really uh, is understanding what the current state is and figuring out what you know what that is, what that costs, what that takes to do today, and what the future state could look like, and then kind of d develop the delta between there to to understand well, okay, if you did this, so service instructions, for example, right? So if we went back and said, okay, how long does it take for you to put together service manuals? Working with a, a customer here last week on this, they had I think they put out like six or eight different manuals a year, and those those manuals are like you know six or seven hundred pages per year, and then they have different instances because there's different languages, and then there's changes, and they're doing a lot of copying and pasting, and you know all of this very painful, uh, uh, repetitive uh, process, right? So there's there's different ways we can solve that by by using some different technology, right? In this case, it's a tool to manage the content creation, where we separate out the content from the formatting, and it makes it much much easier. So to do those same six or eight manuals that are you know 700 pages each, um, you know we can sort of modularize that and help them with that process. So uh, you know it really becomes a, an issue of manage, measuring the distant difference between current state and future state. That's a really specific example. But that's kind of the process where, you know, we've got to dig in and understand, you know, what do things look like today? What's the problem? Uh, what's, what's the cost? You know, how much time does it take? You know, kind of get back to hard metrics, things we can measure, and then look at how that can be in the future using a different approach, whether that's, uh, you know, training for people, whether that's different technology, different software, or maybe even a different process. Right. So it may be one, some, or all of those different things that come together, but it really comes back down to understanding the current state of business and then figuring out what does it look like in the future. We talk in terms of positive business outcomes, right? So um, there's got to be a compelling reason for doing something, and that's what we do is understand the current state and then map that into solutions with an eye towards uh, the positive business outcome of doing things. I know, Dan, if you have any additional color or, or uh, whatever you want to add to that. Yeah, so, so I, can, I, I can give a couple of examples because I think that's a really good question. Uh, most manufacturers are out there looking at how do they take advantage of the industry of California. You know, how do they implement that? How do they take it? It's an elephant, and how do you eat that thing? Um, so almost all of our clients uh, are discrete manufacturers. And they'll come to us and they'll, they'll want to start at one very specific point and go, let's try this out. And as Todd said, it, you know, you're, we're going to have to hit some hard metrics and positive business outcomes uh, before they're going to implement something like this because it's a big project. We have a client that's in the construction industry and they had a uh, quality control manager who was involved in all the executive meetings and nobody was looking at his stuff. And he found out nobody was looking at quality and nobody really cared about quality because he just quit doing the reports for a month. 
and nobody called him on it. Nobody called him on it. And so he said, we got a problem. And he took that to his management and said, we got a problem. I want to implement Industry 4.0 for, for our factory uh, to focus on quality. And I think I can drive our quality through the roof by doing that. They're a roofing company, oh, by the way. <laughs> a little fun there. And, and so uh, his, his, uh, you know, his management team got on board with that. And what he did was he gamified the quality for each line in the manufacturing floor. And, and they started with baseball. And each line was a different uh, baseball team. And then they went to ships. So they, they, they had different ships. And then they, through the season, uh, used quality as kind of how you kept score in the, in, in the baseball series. And then they had playoffs, and then they had a World Series. And it got, it got everybody so focused on quality and what they were doing because it was actually fun, and they didn't feel like somebody was watching over their shoulder. And so they, they really saw a significant improvement in quality by implementing Industry 4.0 in that factory through all of those lines. Now, that was, that was not a just, you know, get it up and get it going. That was, it took time to, to get there, but you know, they showed, he showed the benefits. He showed the return on investment. Yesterday, I was walking a factory floor uh, for someone in Houston, and their, their issue is turnover. Um, they, they've hired 10 people this year, this year, for, for one particular portion of that factory, and they've retained two so far. Retain two out of that ten, and so we're, we're looking at and developing a return on investment model that says if you implement augmented reality or constructions on the factory floor, you'll be able to get your people up to speed this much faster, which will impact the people you already have there because they won't have to be spending all that time mentoring and training and teaching those people on the job training. And because the people become successful more quickly, and they'll be interacting with something. Uh, I mean, you see, Dan does it this way, paper and pen. That's the way people my age do things. <laughs> um, but that's not the way my kids do things. They do things like this. This is what they use. And so when they're interacting with that, they're much more likely to become successful and to stay with the company so that they're not having to go hire these people over and over. And we've done this iteratively with this, building a, a return on investment, and, and we, we find out different pieces of information along the way. Oh, by the way, they're paying a recruiting company 30% for each of those people's salary. And that goes into that return on investment in, in terms of that turnover. And so we walked the factory and he said, this is, you know, I'm asking the guy and go, so how are you going to really deploy this? Let's talk about this. This is nice. This is cool. How, and so we talked about where we're going to put, you know, monitors, how we're going to actually do things and implement it. And, you know, they will be implementing this because there's a specific return on investment for that. So great question. Well, we're going to another, just, just be quick. Does this help with the idea that, you know, there are companies that shortcut quality metrics in order to ship. Would this sort of shine a light on all that? It, it, it certainly would. You know, the issue is who is your customer in terms of doing that? Um, is your customer the plant manager? Is your customer executive management? Is your customer really the customer of that company doing the manufacturing? So that, that's, that's all kinds of questions that are important. Um, again, in Houston, so we talked about Industry 4.0. I want to switch to kind of smart connected products because a lot of us are, are talking about smart connected products. In, in the oil, energy, and gas business, right? Um, it, it's for, for um, upstream, what, what happens downhole is critically important. Um, but the upstream company, that's 
their data. That's their stuff. They view that as proprietary. They're the ones who want that data. If I'm making valves and seals for that company and I want a smart connected product, how do I get access to that? Okay, because maybe, maybe you know, Exxon Mobil doesn't want to share that data with me. Now, yeah. well, they definitely don't. They definitely don't. I know, they definitely don't. <laughs> and, and so you have, to, you have to kind of work through who the customer mm -hmm. is and where the value proposition is for the data. Because that really becomes the issue you know, when, when you're talking with those kinds of that answers your question there. Well, and I'll have I have one last thing to add on the ROI piece. Really, we have and Todd mentioned it previously in the um, in his his uh, in his deck is. We have case studies and references from previous clients. So JR Automation is a perfect example. Um, from a high level, you know, their original valuation was 18 million. They sold a couple of years ago for 1.4 billion, and that was after implementing several of our solutions. So um, that's another piece to to where we can kind of prove that that this stuff works. Yes, go ahead. So your application, your platform, could be integrated, not just real time in the manufacturing process, but for manufacturing individual systems. Let me give you an example. I had a client who had levitating shafts and high dollar compressors. Levitating shafts means no bearings, no oil. You know. But each one of these things, um, I would sense it as far as even when they manufacture the shaft. And if the compressor is induced some kind of vibration, say it's in a building, elevator bottoms out. The shafts can start cavitating, oscillating. So they, they have to, for each one built, they have to go ahead during the manufacturing process, introduce different uh, vibrations and that sort of thing. And if there's an oscillation, shape the shaft or do whatever to optimize it so it's an even this type of vibration to occur. Your software then can be integrated into that to not only optimize that process, but make a digital certificate to be able to say, with this particular compressor, here's the certification that we've gone through the steps to make it immune to these types of vibrations. As far as, you know, an additional uh, <clears throat> comfort level that someone's going to spend $1,500,000 on a compressor, that it's, it's not going to fail because it's in the building later the garage door downstairs on the third floor came down and started causing it. And then you can't even repair the problem. <clears throat> so you, it looks to me like your, your software could be integrated into something. It, it could be. Uh, Todd, if you don't mind, I'm going to take that. So, so uh, if you think of that as a smart connected product, so I've got a, I've got a levitated shaft, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect to it, okay? So I'm going to run it through all kinds of simulation. Right. Okay. I'm going to actually run it through real, real-time oscillations, and I'm going to use uh, again using ThingWorks. So that's our IoT platform of choice. I'm going to run it through those oscillations, and I'm going to run it through ThingWorks predictive analytics uh, engine. So we're still talking about on the manufacturing. Nope, I, I, I can do that in the field. I can do it in the field now. I want to test this. So, yes, I can do it in the field. Uh, that's going to give you real-time data about all that stuff in the field. But before I get to the field, I need to answer your question, which is I want to certify that, right? Yeah, like a fine Swiss watch. Right. So, so I'm going to run that through various test scenarios. Now, we don't do the testing, so you're going to have to have somebody like Yeah, they, yeah, they know how to do it, but it's very difficult. Right, so, but but to get that certification, I'm going to need somebody like UL or Intertech or where uh, uh, Veritas, somebody like Euro Veritas, somebody like that to do that. Right. Um, so so I would I would run it through there, getting real time data. I'd run it through the predictive analytics machine, and it would say, hey, in these scenarios, this is you know certified. And then I would, okay, now we're selling that, and it's in the field. Okay, and we're, it's a connected product, it's a smart connected product. 
that's what we call it. And we'd be getting that data, and we're gonna we're gonna pull in all that data and we're gonna analyze it, and we should get, we should get over time. Now, hopefully, because we've done all the pre-work, the time period's very short, we should get where hey, we know things are working perfectly all the time, and I can very quickly say, boom, this one's out of this one's out of sync. Let's stop that and replace it. See what I'm saying there? Even before it got even before it gets to yeah, we're I'm going to because I'm getting real time data on that. I'm going to before it gets to that point, I'm going to be able to put a so stop you can to dispatch a separate pair of services nine to five, not Sunday. Exactly, and I can put a I can communicate to put a halt to that so that it so that things don't go out of whack, right? I mean that that's that's what happens in something like that is it, it if you can stop it before it starts then it's not a it's not a whole busted system if it if you don't stop it until after it's failed it's not only broken here but it's it's broken the whole system that it's contained in sure. so that's the value proposition if doing both those things stopping it before it fails a warning an alert something like that. As well as dispatching during normal business hours versus Sunday afternoon. Okay, does that answer that? Yeah, I was thinking more about the during the manufacturing process when you're off line before it gets out the door. But you're also seeing, in addition to that, you can have ongoing real time monitoring in the field. And that way, too, if there is an occurrence, you may have captured what that oscillation was that induced exactly the cavitation. Exactly. Uh, you're going to do it during the manufacturing process to get that information. That allows you to get the well, done so the testing optimized that device, that right. shaft. Right. Yeah. And and that allows you to get the testing certification. And then you continue monitoring it in the field, which gives you the added comfort of, hey, oh, by the way, this has a safety feature. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. So don't. Don't hear me wrong on right. that. Those are, <laughs> those are very complex yeah. things. To high, do. high dollar equipment, yes. and if it goes down, you create a lot of other problems. So exactly. The cost of the down. Yeah. Well, well, one, cost, safety features, all those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah, it seems like the thick of analytics would give you the clue prior to the problem actually happening and the cost of down. That that's correct. Yep. Uh, predictive, yep. again, predictive analytics, and I'll let Todd expand on this, but predictive analytics doesn't, it's not a magic box. It doesn't tell you something just right off the bat. It learns right. and knows, and you have, and, and for you to do that, you have to be looking at certain things. You have to put a lot of smarts into that analytics engine before it can tell you that. It's, well, I'd love to tell you it's a magic box, but it isn't. So, so over time it creates a program. <laughs> yes. Okay. And but but your data problems. scientists are going to be putting algorithms into that initially, and then that will get better over time. Okay. Todd, do you want to add Yeah, on did that? you have something to add? If so, I'll go ahead and mute you, Todd. Yeah, I, all I was, uh, yeah, all I was going to do is just kind of step through some of the stuff that uh, was kind of um, clicking through, trying to be Vanna in the background as a backdrop for Dan as we were, uh, as he was talking about things. This is just one incarnation of what that can look like for tracking, specifically pump information, right? So monitoring that in real time, streaming the analytics for that, but then also get, getting back into the predictive analytics. And I think uh, Dan covered it pretty well. All I was going to add here was, you know, this is just one sort of dashboard that can be created to show what that looks like. But like you said, you kind of got to give it the rules or teach it uh, what it's supposed to be looking for. And then once it starts to learn that and see uh, data coming in from the devices in the field, it can uh, help you build these uh, reports and understand more about what's going on with the system. The other thing that I was going to show here too was uh, I have the HoloLens strapped on. So I thought that might be fun just to kind of look at that. I don't know. I, somebody's got to tell me we're at nine o'clock. How long? Do we have before we transition into uh, pure Q&A? 9, 9, 10 is a hard stop. Yeah, stop. Okay. Um, well, I could do that. Yeah, quickly. Um, I could do that quickly. Go for it. All right. So uh, that might be a bit of a challenge because we're going to get this sort of an echo thing here. Um, I'm presenting that one main screen. 
Um, so what we have here, this is the uh, the augmented reality I'm actually casting from the HoloLens. So what you see on the screen, I'll try and move over here so we don't get too much of that uh, infinite uh, window thing. But over here is my little control panel, and right. So this is the the experience that we we're looking at. So what you're seeing on the screen is what I'm seeing in my HoloLens uh, projection. So this is the smart uh, idea sorter that we were just looking at before, and I built this uh, experience just to give you an idea about what this augmented reality looks like, right? So this object is not here in front of me, but it's it's uh, augmented reality. So let's go ahead and hit the first play button, and we'll move in that first block right here. And then there's two more blocks that'll go in this general area right here. Try and keep that on the screen. I'll go ahead and hit the next play button. Try and keep that all together here. So it'll drop in that block, and then we'll bring in another block here. Drop that in. But as you can see, it kind of move around you get an idea of I can actually get up close and look and see you know, augmented reality. Obviously, this device is not in the room with me here, but I can see all of the detail about that um, inside the HoloLens, and I can interact with that and, and build out sort of uh, whatever experience it is that I need to, to share with the user as far as assembly or service or uh, IoT data that I might want to present for them. I can reset that back to zero. So that uh, that was the other thing I wanted to show there was just a quick overview of what that might look like through a HoloLens uh, as opposed to looking at that with a phone or a tablet type device. <laughs> Someone said he thinks you have a virtual oil leak. <laughs> virtual oil. Virtual oh. <laughs> virtual oil leak. Oh, yep. Oh, yep. <laughs> I think that might just. I think that might just be my mouse. Yep. Be my mouse. Yep. <laughs> All right, so that, that was what I was going to show there, just to, we talked show, about the augmented reality yeah. experience, right? So that's uh, what that can look like. So I just flipped the visor up on my headset, so that's why it's looking at my ceiling. But um, just wanted to make sure that we at least got, got you a taste of what the augmented reality can look like using a HoloLens device. Thanks, Todd. Any so other? I have, I have a serious yep. question. It's not going to sound like a serious question. Okay. Do you have experience with people getting motion sickness while they're wearing an AR goggles? <laughs> did you hear that, Todd? I I did, and and I, no. I did, and, and no. Okay. Uh, you want to mute out uh, there, Mike? Mute out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm know. mute now. Yeah, so with respect to the motion sickness stuff, actually not, um, because you know what you're seeing, let me drag this other window over here, right? So um, I'll flip the visor down. Um, so you, yeah, I'm sorry about that. We're gonna get the infinite window thing going on there. Um, but no, I mean, so the the object is actually stationary in front of me, right? So I, I think you'd probably get motion sickness if you're watching the cast back over here on the screen over here. But the motion sickness doesn't really come into play because uh, what I'm actually seeing here in front of me is very stationary. And, uh, you know, I don't, um, I think I, I can understand the question because if you're trying to watch back here what's happening on, on the screen, um, it, it looks a little bit different. The objects are very stationary and very fixed uh, unless I make the move or something like that. I turn the, turn the auger on or the ball actually goes through the track or something like that. Um, it's just as if you would be seeing it in front of you. So the, the motion sickness, um, I haven't really seen that be a, a factor in general. It might be a, just a function of, a, just um, a function of just um, doing these presentations over the web. If you're in, in person and you have the HoloLens on, I don't think you'd see that be a problem. Any other questions, comments? Just a quick, what's, what's the time frame from if you were to go from somebody who doesn't have any kind of automation to getting to this? Is it a couple of year deal usually, or I'm sure, like you say, just pick and choose a little bit, start somewhere if you're, if you're getting going with something and then migrate. Kind of like when you set, set the expectation with the customer, it's going to be a couple of years before you're gaining the, the real value of it. And that, that's a great question because, of course, we can go at whatever speed the, the client wants to go at. But, but what we've found to be the best case is. Um, Again, for almost all of our clients, discrete manufacturers, if you think of it, either in manufacturing or smart connection or products, a crawl, walk, run way is the way they want to do it. And so we'll typically start, um, but, but we, like to, we like to set um, positive business outcomes for each of those aspects 
so that we don't get stuck in pilot purgatory. You know? And so that crawl, walk, run usually is a proof of concept or a pilot. And, and we like to execute that pretty quickly. You know, you want to you get it up and running, you want to fail fast. We take an agile approach to that, and we iterate pretty quickly. Boom, 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 boom. And then we're, we've, we're already defining the, that next step, that pilot project, which might be implementing uh, across the, the whole manufacturing line. We might, you know, in the factory, it might be one piece of equipment okay, with just two or three data points. OE, you know, uh, mean time between failures, those kinds of things, right? Big high level. And then it's going to be across that whole factory line, again, looking at all of those metrics that plant supervisors, plant, you know, managers uh, care about. And then it might be expanding past that in the factory to look at all of the aspects of how that plant is running, including scrap, supply chain, all of the ins and outs, you know, the, the, the whole process. So that's going to be kind of, that's kind of that crawl, walk, run process. And, it, and, and if it doesn't have executive support across all that, if you haven't sold the ROI for that whole piece, it, you're just going to get stuck. And then it's going to take longer than two, or, than two years. Thank you. So what's the concept that Depends on what we're trying to accomplish. That, that's a good question. Uh, what, what's the typical proof of concept time frame? Generally speaking, what we've seen is we try to get clients down to about four to six weeks. Uh, we, I've had clients come to me and say, hey, we want a proof of concept, and we want to get this done in two weeks, and this is what we want. You know, they want live data, streaming data, they want everything. <coughs> so let me repeat that back to you. And you repeat it back to them, and they realize how ridiculous that sounds. <laughs> so, but good question. About four weeks is what we're shooting for. Can be as little as two weeks, can be as much as six days. So I would think four weeks, but the times of the other times, the other dollars that are going to be what are the modifications? That's about the cost. Here. That's about the cost. Yeah, about the uh, good question costing. We're looking at about twelve thousand to you know fifty, sixty thousand, depending on how refined and focused that is. Okay. And that, generally speaking, just is our applications, uh, our development engineers, our, our development solution architect. Okay, it doesn't include the software. So. Typically speaking, we're looking at software for pilot and beyond. Anything beyond 30 days. That is then mostly in uh, open source or PTC. It's, we, uh, our team will work in Azure, all of the Azure pieces. There's a couple of other pieces of software that we're working with I'm not at liberty to talk about right now, but it's typically going to be ThingWorks and Azure IoT is where we've done most of our work. We've done AWS, we've done Google, but it's the Azure solutions we we have expertise in. Well, awesome, guys. Let's put them on here.